All right, we are going to be talking about cellular transport, which is concept two. And this is an extremely important for understanding something called homeostasis. Homeostasis is the need of an organism to maintain and regulate constant or stable internal conditions. So think that prefix homo or homeo is referring to same. So keeping things the same and stasis is referring to stability. So we're trying to keep this internal environment nice and stable. So let's think, how do you think your body regulates? How do you think it maintains homeostasis? You know, there's probably some things that you can keep think about, but one of the things, you know, we have temperature, pH, concentration of materials and nutrients. They all have to be maintained in a relatively narrow margin. You know, most of us know that your body functions um, at a temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If your body gets too hot, it regulates itself to maintain homeostasis by sweating in order to cool your body temperature down. So your body has these natural things that it does in order to regulate itself. But looking at a cellular, cellular level, most of homeostasis is maintained by the cell membrane, controlling what goes in and out of the cell. So we're really going to focus on that organelle of the cell membrane today and how it helps maintain homeostasis. So th I love this picture of the cell membrane because it shows that the cell membrane has a very complex structure. And because of its structure, it is selectively permeable, meaning that only certain things can go across it freely. Other things have to go through a little gate, like a protein channel, like we see these, and some things can't get through at all. So it's picky about what it, let go, it lets go in and out of it. And the transport methods can either be passive or active. So all transport materials is either passive or active. So passive transport means it requires no extra energy. And this is because molecules are going to move from a high concentration, meaning very squished together, to a low concentration, so spread out. So this is something that's going to happen naturally. It's not going to require energy for it to spread out in this way. We say that it's going down the concentration gradient. So think of this like a slide. High concentration would be at the top of the slide. Low concentration is at the bottom of the slide. Naturally, if you're sitting at the top, you're going to be pulled down the slide or down the concentration gradient. It doesn't require extra energy. You don't need to push. It's just going to happen. And that's like passive transport. Active transport, though, does require extra energy in the form of ATP, which we'll talk about more in our next unit. And it requires this extra energy to be spent in order to bring materials either in or out of the cell. And be this is because it's going to move from low concentration to high concentration. So where particles are not as spread out to where they are, so from where they are spread out to where they're really squished together. Think if you're going to climb up a slide, so from low to high, that's going to take energy because it's not what naturally wants to happen because you're going against the gradient or against the slide. So that's the main difference between passive and active transport. And we're going to talk about three types of each. So for passive transport, we're going to talk about diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. So all of these, no extra energy going down the concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Active transport, though, is molecular pumps, exocytosis, and endocytosis. So all of these are going to require extra energy in the form of ATP, and they're going to tend to bring things in or out of the cell against the concentration gradient. So we're going to zoom in on each one, but before we do that, there's some words you need to know. I've already said a few of them, so I want to make sure we understand these before I keep referring to them. First is solute. Hopefully you learned this in physical science, but a solute is what is getting dissolved. So think like lemonade powder is what's being dissolved. Solvent is what does the dissolving. So water would dissolve the lemonade powder, which would be the solute. A solution is the uniform mixture of these of two or more substances. So actual lemonade is a solution of the solute lemonade powder dissolved in the solvent water. And so this will be important as we talk through if there's a high concentration of solute or a high concentration of solvent. Those are words you want to make sure you know. 
Speaking of concentration, that is the amount of solute that is dissolved in solvent. Think, if I had a really high concentration lemonade, it would be really strong or really sour, really sweet. Whereas a low concentration lemonade would be really, really watery. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about concentrations. We can abbreviate concentration with some brackets. So if you ever want to abbreviate in your notes or if you see me abbreviating on the board, those brackets represent concentration. All right, so let's talk about each one of these. First is diffusion. This is the spreading out of molecules across the cell membrane until they're equally concentrated on both sides of the membrane. Remember, this is passive, so molecules are moving down the concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Those are my brackets, those are my abbreviations. They're going down the slide. A real example of this is oxygen and carbon dioxide, or O2 and CO2. Your body, this naturally, these diffuse passively across your cell membranes in order to make sure all your cells are receiving the oxygen they need and carbon dioxide is being removed when it needs to be removed. Realistically, in a real world example also, not in your body, I want you to think of diffusion as like when your mom makes, or your granny, or your aunt or someone makes bacon or they make chocolate chip cookies. The, strong, the smell is very strongly concentrated in the kitchen. That bacon smell is so strong. And it may not be concentrated in your room at all, but over time that smell naturally diffuses through the house and eventually the whole house will smell a little bit like bacon or a little bit like warm chocolate chip cookies. And that's what diffusion does. In a picture, all right, we've got this dotted line to represent the selectively permeable cell membrane. On this side, we clearly have more solutes. We have a higher concentration of solute, lower concentration of solute on this side. So according to diffusion, since it goes from high to low, we expect it to move towards the right. So over time, we'd expect it to move in this direction until it was balanced on both sides. That's what we would expect to see with diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is similar but a little bit different. This requires a transport protein to act as a protein channel to help or facilitate the diffusion of molecules that normally just couldn't pass through the cell membrane. So some molecules are too big or they're too polar to travel through the cell membrane on their own. So they're going to have to go through a little channel. They're still moving down the gradient from high to low. And it's still not requiring energy. But the examples of this are like glucose, which is a sugar, or sodium, which is a salt. Glucose is a large molecule, and sodium is a charged or polar molecule. It's an ion. So these things don't just naturally get through the cell membrane due to the selective permeability of it. Thus, they have to go through these little tunnels or these protein channels made from transport proteins. So really similar to our previous picture, we've got the high concentration of particles or solute over here, low here, but we have this extra channel that the particles will go through. So over time, they'll go through that so that they can balance out. So same idea, we just add this protein channel. Now osmosis is a little bit special. This is the diffusion of water. So specifically, we're looking at water across the cell membrane. So we're going to move water to balance things out. So we're looking at the concentration of water. Notice I'm really emphasizing the idea that this is water. So water molecules move down the gradient. So we're moving from where there's high concentrations of water to low concentrations of water. So, for example, let's look at this picture. Now just looking at this beaker, you may say, oh, well, there's equal amounts of water on each side because it's the same height of or same volume of water. Now what you'll notice, though, is think about this being the lemonade. If this has all this lemonade powder in it, this side's going to be a lot stronger, a lot sweeter, whereas this side's going to be a lot weaker. So over time, for the balance, the concentration of the lemonades to be balanced, so they're all the same concentration, we would expect water to move this direction from where there's more water and less solute to where there's less water and more solute, so that over time, the, these lemonades would taste the same. So that's what we're kind of looking for here. Now, in osmosis, there's three types of solutions that a cell may be placed in. One type would be a hypertonic solution. This is where the water concentration is below what's in the cell cytoplasm. So there's less water outside of the cell than there is inside. This is going to cause water to rush out of the cell. And so it's going to move out, and that's going to cause the cell to shrivel up as it moves out. 
Salt water is a hypertonic solution. Another type of solution that a cell can be in is hypotonic. And this is when the water concentration is greater or more than what's found inside the cell. So there's more water outside than there is inside the cell. So water is going to rush into the cell and it's going to cause the cell to swell. And if the cell gets too big, it could potentially burst, which we say is called lysing. L-Y-S-E. It can lyse. But it can swell up or potentially burst or lyse. The cell could also be in an isotonic solution. So think I is I for identical. So it has identical water concentrations to what's found inside the cell. It's the same inside and out, so the cell's not going to change. It's going to stay the same as water moves in and out of it evenly. So its size won't change. So let's look at this visually. All right, so hypertonic. More water inside, less water outside. So water's going to rush out of the cell, causing the cell to shrivel up. Hypotonic, there's more water outside, less water inside, so water's going to rush into the cell, and that's going to cause the cell to swell. Isotonic, it's equal concentrations of water inside and outside the cell, so water's going to move in and out of the cell evenly, and the cell's going to stay the same size. So I think these visuals really help. I highly suggest you drawing these, um, pausing the video and drawing these in the margin of your notes so that you have these visually to understand the differences. I always think hypo like a hippo, and hippos are big, so they make the cell swell. And then the I for identical, um, so that's kind of how I remember those. All right, that is passive transport. Let's move on to active. So just a reminder, not all substances can just move across the cell freely. Some of them have to be go uphill or pushed uphill against the gradient, and this requires them to go from low to high, and or they may be too big, and so we have to like envelop them, and all of these are going to require extra energy. So we're going to talk through these three. First is molecular pumps. So this is when the cell is going to use energy to pump molecules across the membrane through a protein channel. So just like facilitated diffusion, we're using a protein channel, but this time it requires energy because we're going up the slide or up the gradient. So this is really important because it allows the cell to concentrate key molecules within the cell or potentially remove waste really quickly if it's needed. Examples are things like calcium, potassium, chlorine, sodium. These are all ions. They're charged particles. Notice there are charges on them. Those do not travel through the cell membrane well. So they're going to have to go through a protein channel regardless. And if they're going to be moved against the gradient, it's going to take energy, which is why it's called a molecular pump. The sodium potassium pump is a really big one in, fun in how your cell functions. All right, so similar picture we saw in facilitated diffusion. Here's the one difference. Air is going to go the opposite direction. Energy is going to move from low to high, and it's going to require, excuse me, molecules are moving from low to high, and it's going to require energy to do that. And over time, we'll see it's way more concentrated on one side than the other. That's what a molecular pump does. That's the big difference. So even if you want to click back a few, refer to what we saw in facilitated diffusion, it was a very similar picture, but we saw the arrows going different directions and the result is a different result. All right, next is endocytosis. This is when the cell is going to use energy because it's active transport to import large amounts of material into the cell. So endo, we're bringing them in, cyto refers to the cytoplasm, so we're bringing them into the cytoplasm, and it's going to use a vesicle to do it. So we're going to take these particles, we're going to form a vesicle around them to bring them into the cell. So we're bringing them in. Example, this is how white blood cells engulf bacteria in order to fight infection. So they'll take in this bacteria using vesicles, and then they'll destroy that bacteria. Remember, that requires energy. Exocytosis is we're going to use energy to export larger materials out of the cell using a vesicle still. So we're going to move those materials out. This is how nerve cells send neurotransmitters to pass signals to your brain as they do use exocytosis to get those signals out. All right, last but not least is the summary chart. really want you to just pause, take the time to do this. I want you to fill in. You know, we have the six types of transport here. You're going to use the clues that are provided to figure out what goes where and to think about how could each of these be used to help maintain homeostasis. A few of them I'm providing, but the other ones I really want you to think about yourself. All right, and that's concept two.